Welcome to Church on the Couch. It's Palm Sunday. I am joined today by Susan Candy, who is the organist at Pennville United Methodist Church, and Elizabeth Kisselstein, who will be providing some special music and offering some prayers during our service today. This is the beginning of the holiest week, and it's a holy day that is uh, jubilant and sad, all on the same thing. And I think you will find that as a recurring theme as we move throughout this week, as we see these steps that Jesus is taking as he moves closer and closer to the cross of Good Friday. Today we begin waving palms, seeing folks throwing their cloaks into the road as Jesus comes into that holy city of Jerusalem. So let us begin our worship now. And I remind you that in our preview, I told you that you could grab a branch off of out of your yard, or you could make a branch, or grab one of the uh, branches that you've received in the past, and wave them during some of our jubilant songs. But friends, let us just settle our minds and open our hearts, and let us worship God together. With great joy, we welcome you, Lord Jesus. The journey has been long, and we have longed to enter the holy city. You come into our hearts and our lives humbly, patiently, encouraging us to learn and grow, to embark on journeys of hope and healing. Open our hearts today to hear your words as we sing praise to you. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the Lord's name. Amen. Amen. Hear these words from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 to 44. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he had told them. 
As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road down goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Thank you. Palm Sunday stands as one of the most significant days in Christianity, leading us into our holiest week. This moment when Jesus arrives in Jerusalem sets into motion a series of events that are so dramatic and so horrific that it's hard for us to even catch our breath. We will have turning of tables and intrigue and betrayal. We'll see washing of feet and taking part in the Last Supper. We'll see praying in the garden. And then we'll witness an arrest, and denial, and a trial, and an excruciating crucifixion. And all that will happen by the time we're together next week. Like most journeys, we're in a hurry to get to our destination. We've already set our sights on Easter. But to get there, we must arrive here at this moment. We read that Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. He was determined to know and fulfill God's will. And Jerusalem is no ordinary city. It's a holy city. A city of so many psalms and laments. A city full of deep prophecies. It was the destination of many pilgrimages. But by the time of Jesus' arrival, the temple had become about much more than religion. It had become much to Jesus' lament, part of the domination system tied to Roman taxes. And now an economic and political center. And so much of what was happening there was in direct opposition to Jesus' ministry and his vision of God's kingdom. That was the Jerusalem that Jesus set his face to and was about to enter on what we now know as Palm Sunday. It's important to know that there were two processions that day. In their book, The Last Week, Jesus's, Jesus scholars Marcus Borg and John Crossan give us this riveting, riveting image of what the beginning of Passover week really must have looked like. From the west entered Pontius Pilate on a horse. He was likely draped in all the formality and glory of imperial power, and he was flanked by the cavalry and, and soldiers marching in. And Pilate had traveled from Caesarea on the sea, which is a 60-mile trip to Jerusalem. And his purpose was more political than religious, for it was common practice for the Roman governors to be in Jerusalem for the major Jewish fest festivals. So just take a minute and imagine that regal entrance of Pilate. All the pomp, all the circumstance. Then, from the east, we have a very different procession. One that Borg and Cross and call a peasant procession. 
And this was truly a triumphal entry. And here we have Jesus on a donkey, surrounded by his followers and welcomed by this throng of people who live under Roman rule, but seek to be in this kingdom that Jesus has been describing for all of these weeks. And they're throwing down their garments and they're reaching for their palms and they're shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. All in this holy city that is under Roman rule that has referred to Caesar as son of God, Lord, Savior, titles that have continued since the rule of Augustus, who was believed to be a descendant of Apollo. And under Caesar's rule, we have Roman peace, which is a time of peace and expansion that is based on domination and ruthless power. And here comes Jesus, the one whose ministry proclaims justice and mercy and the love of God. Unlike the kingdom of Caesar, this kingdom of God is one of peace without war, one of without domination and power. It is the Messiah and the kingdom that has been prophesied, prophesied in Isaiah. It's a contrast that's been building and a confrontation that was inevitable. And as we know now, was only going to get worse as the week wore on. We get some clues of the escalating crisis and the warning from the Pharisees to Jesus to order your disciples to stop. It echoes that earlier warning to Jesus to leave the city because Herod was looking to kill him. Jesus replies with a faithful, if not slightly defiant response that if the crowd was silenced, the stones would cry out. We can take a few things from that response. The first thing is perhaps that Jesus represents a truth that cannot be silenced, maybe temporarily, but can't be silenced for long. And secondly, if the followers of Jesus fell away because of fear or complacency, God's going to raise up more followers. And the third thing is the prophetic message from Habakkuk that injustice will not prevail. And the very stones of the house built by corruption will cry out from the wall. It is those prophetic words that capture the mood of this moment. That strike the stark contrast between the Roman rule represented and what Jesus Christ offered. They are also the words that foreshadow what is ahead. There is jubilation on this day. Because followers, even though they don't quite understand Christ or his message, and they will quickly fall away, they do see a glimpse of this kingdom and become a part of this promise. Yes, there is jubilation on this journey, but there are also tears on this journey. Jesus weeps over the city. Jesus laments this political reality that people's justice cannot look like God's justice as long as they continue to turn away from God. As Jesus journeys closer and closer to the cross, he calls on the people to turn and face God so that they may see clearly his call to righteousness and justice. Today, in this moment, we stand at the beginning of Holy Week. Let's savor that moment. Let's soak in that moment. But let's not lose the point of the moment as we move on through the days of Holy Week. The message that Christ brought into the city and that message is the same one that we receive today. That the kingdom of God far outreaches any kingdom that we can create. And that the peace of Christ is not a peace that is guaranteed through power and oppression, but rejects power and is available to even the oppressed. We enter Holy Week not walking away from that message, but reinforced by that message. In the coming days, Jesus will face increased opposition, and he will see his followers fall off, and he will turn tables in the temple, and he will be uh, rejected by the same people that were waving palms and throwing down the garments just days before. And on Thursday night,
when Jesus' commandment to love one another gets this vivid expression of washing of the feet and the sharing of the bread is also the same night that he will experience denial. Not by a stranger, but by a follower. Not by an enemy, but by a dear friend. Judas has been bought and his close friend Peter denies him and will not even be there when Jesus faces trial and then hangs on the cross. And then Friday will be a day of turmoil and rejection and deep pain as Jesus is put to death. Lent is a journey to Easter, one that calls us to turn and to walk toward Jesus. We've experienced much on this journey, and today we do see a triumphal entry and a jubilant response. And yes, tears on this journey. May this be a blessed and meaningful Holy Week for each of us as we continue to walk. Amen. Loving God, we sing and shout, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! How easy it is to ignore what is to come. Anger, betrayal, torture, and death. Forgive us when we move from the celebration of Palm Sunday to Easter without taking time to hear or experience the passion and depths in between. Forgive us for the times we have fallen short. Help us to be faithful to your gospel of love and liberation. Surround us with your enabling grace. Bless us with a community to help us live a life of faithfulness. Faithfulness to the one who came to teach us how to live and how to love. Faithfulness to the one for whom we are waving palms today. Amen. Amen. It's such a joy to be together, even though this is a Palm Sunday gathering that I wouldn't have imagined in years, in a million years maybe. And of course, next week we'll gather differently for Easter as well. But you know what? There's something really beautiful about the way that we have been gathering. Today, I am happy to have two other people with me and for us to be available on Zoom and for you to hear the music live. But it's also been a blessing to uh, be able to do some reflections and have us uh, see them from our couch and worship together. That worship is alive and well. So as we move into this Holy Week, it's much different. But our hearts are full as we pray, we read scripture and reflect on it, and we sing. The church is the church. And we're seeing that come alive even in the time of pandemic. Our hearts are full and we have so many things that I know are on our hearts and minds as we have been journeying through these weeks together. We see the growing pandemic and it's difficult uh, to see so many people are sick and affected by this. And those who aren't affected directly by illness have been affected 
um, in so many other ways. There is not really a life that hasn't been touched by this, with businesses closing, schools uh, closing, many people being furloughed, so many folks being distanced from one another, family members being separated and not being able to see one another, even as we move into holy time. All of it is very difficult. Uh, folks that are in the hospital are often not able to uh, be with family members. And one of the newest wrinkles that we're finding even in our own congregation are folks that have some underlying conditions and really need some medical attention are, are being um, discouraged from going to the hospital because the conditions are as safe as they need to be for infection and for some other things. So we pray mightily for all those things. So friends, join me in a time of prayer. Let us pray. God of grace, no matter what happens in all of these days, it's impossible for us not to see your movement among us. In the helpful gestures and the people that are making masks, in the frontline workers, of course, that are, are sacrificing so much, in the folks that are willing to run to stores and do errands for people, the children who've sent cards to so many of our shut-ins and have touched their hearts, and story after story after story has unfolded, and for that we're grateful. Lord God, in this day we ask you to continue to reach out to us in ways that maybe we don't expect to help us see your presence in uh, ways that maybe before we weren't looking. And Lord God, we ask you to be with all those who are sick and who are healing this day, for those who are in nursing homes and long-term care, and for all those who find themselves in isolation. May they, in this time apart, not feel a sense of desperation and know that you are within a breath away. Lord God, touch each one of us in a way this day so that we truly know the love of God that is so present. Lord God, on this holy day, as we move into a holiest of weeks, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. turn to a gospel reading from Matthew chapter 26 verses 36 to 46 and this picks up where Jesus and some of his disciples travel to the garden after having supper together then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane and he said to them sit here while I go over there and pray 
He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed. My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned and to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The Hosannas are fresh on our lips, and we're already leaving the joy of Palm Sunday and moving on to the heavier dramatic moments of the week. Because in reality, it almost happened that fast. It's almost hard to catch our breath as one thing after another happens in rapid succession during this incredible week. A week that began just a few minutes ago with this jubilant parade into Jerusalem and ends with death. Death on the cross. It's a week when human shortcomings come absolutely face to face with God's immeasurable grace. At the beginning of every Lent, we talk about how far we may have strayed from our relationship with God and how in order to return to God, we must first turn. We have to turn back toward Jesus, toward the promise and hope of Easter. And that means turning away from all the things that have called us away in the first place. Whether we like to admit it or not, turning away from Jesus is easier than turning back toward him. Even when we love him, even when we worship him. When Jesus went to the garden to pray that night, he asked his companions to pray with him, but they couldn't even stay awake. And then Judas, one of his disciples, a follower, a friend, not only turned away from Jesus, he turned on him, selling him out and turning him in. Just a few coins separated him from friendship and betrayal. No matter how faithful we are, we tend to fall short. And even his most loyal friend, Peter, didn't stick around to defend him. He started to. But then he denied him. Most of those who love him will desert him. Everything we've known up to this point about humanity is unfortunately playing out true to form. No matter how hard we try, no matter how faithful we try to be, we end up falling short. And as hard as this is to watch unfold, none of this behavior should be surprising to us. Let me ask you, how many times have you fallen asleep? 
I know I have. How many times have we tried to be more faithful? Have we tried to be more intentional in our worship and our devotion, more focused in our prayers, only to drift off, only to lose interest? How many times have you and I looked the other way instead of doing the right thing? How many times have we fallen asleep? We might think we could never do anything as treasonous as what Judas did. But the truth is that we sell each other out every time we talk about each other instead of to each other. The truth is that we turn our backs on Jesus every time we refuse to do something for the least of these. Yes, when we abandon one another, we abandon Jesus. After briefly fighting with soldiers who came to arrest Jesus, the disciples left. When Jesus needed his friends the most, they left. They fell short. While we may never intend to abandon a friend, so often we too fall short. Martin Niemöller said, First they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak out because I'm not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I'm not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. This is a week of sadness and confusion, and it's a week of deep sacrificial love. It's a week when we become so much more aware of how much God loves us, despite our shortfalls despite our sin. Every day of this Holy Week, we are reminded over and over again of those words from John's Gospel. Chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. First spoken to Nicodemus in the shadows and lived out for us in Jesus every day. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. It's a week that when we know that even though we are weak, God's love is strong and God's promises are unbreakable. Let us pray. Lord God, Guide us through this holiest of weeks. Help us to pause each step and take in that moment and to be grateful to you for your amazing love. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? O oh my soul, what wondrous love is this? Amen. Today, we have cheered you on as our champion and hailed you as our hero. Forgive us tomorrow when our enthusiasm wanes. Today we have entrusted you to rescue us from our pitiful circumstances. Forgive us on Tuesday when we decide we can take care of ourselves. Today, we have made you the centerpiece of our very existence. Forgive us on Wednesday when we forget to remember who you are. Today, we have called out to you loudly by name. Forgive us on Thursday when we pretend that we've never met you. Today, we have stared at you with the star-struck eyes of fans and groupies. Forgive us on Friday when we avert our eyes because it's too painful to see you on the cross. 
Today we have expressed our unsuppressed hopefulness in the future you have in store for us. Forgive us on Saturday when we believe all is lost. Today, we have been boldly certain of the earthly ways you will redeem us. Restore us on Sunday when we are startled and awed by your rising. Amen. Receive this benediction. Passing from joy into sorrow and on to elation, we come to Christ this holy week. Today is only part of the story. Jesus' triumph leads to his death, his death to his resurrection. May the journey of the week lead you into the fullness of Christ's love. Amen.